What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Lockdown 23 and 1. Today, we will be entering the courtroom once again. We're going to witness the sentencing of Demetrius Wine. He was just 14 years old when he killed Suzanne Spiller. Four years later, he was arrested and charged with the murder after authorities said the fingerprints on her windows matched his. Police believe he broke into Spiller's home through a back window and violently attacked and killed her on either July 15th or July 16th in 2015. Keep in mind, when this happened, he was 14 years old. The elderly woman ended up losing her life. She was found beaten, strangled, and stabbed five times. So today we're going to see him get sentenced for this crime, and uh, I don't know what to expect with this one. He was 14 when it happened, and a lot of courtrooms take that age into consideration. So when the uh, law requires that the last voice I hear from before we move to the actual sentencing in the case is yours. It's called the right of elocution. You have the right to tell me what you think I need to hear before we move to sentencing. Before you get smoked, because you killed an elderly woman, punk. Second of all, the audio and video quality in this courtroom is superb. Third of all, that drop top semi gloss is painted on just right. What would you like to say? You just stand up, what? Either way. Yeah, stand your ass <clears throat> up, dog. Show some respect for the elderly you I killed. Say, uh, I said, I'm not, I know I'm not perfect, but I don't know I'm not perfect in this life, but I'm going to make changes in my life. But I never know if I'm sad for the, uh, the family. After I've been doing it, I know, I know the uh, victim. And, um, I, mean, I know that if anything that happens to me, I've been telling the same way. I just want to say that. What's up with your fucking tie, bruh? That's disrespect all in itself. Oh, no, it's falling. Uh, oh, no, I can't. Oh, no, I don't know exactly what to say. This dude, you know, I'm just, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know exactly what to say, but it just blew, uh, be the law and be the judge, so I don't really know what to say, so that's right. Well, if you don't know what to say, why the hell you stand up to say anything? This guy's a damn man. Well. <laughs> the judge goes, gotta smoke. Let me start by making some general comments. Ah, oh, that glass is so clean. Of course. This was a brutal murder. Yeah, it was. Broken jaw, strangulation. Damn. Multiple stab wounds, running four to five inches deep. <clears throat> the terror of a woman, elderly woman living on her own. Yeah. Attacked in her bed in the dead of the night. Oh, man. Five years of unknown. Attacked her in her own bed while she was asleep at night. This is unreal. To live with that? I... I can just barely wrap my head around the pain, the frustration, the anger, um, the rage, and returning again to the pain at the loss of a um, mother, a grandmother. I can't artist, imagine someone doing that to my clearly, mama while she's sleeping. Uh, somebody deeply involved in her community. And I did, I want you all to know that I read um, the uh, statements that were sent to me and certainly take note of all of the things that she represented to so many people. Uh, and to extend my sympathy as a human being. About to make what this judge cry, through, man. Especially those closest to you, Mr. Speller, Mr. Speller, other family members. I'm just very sorry for what happened. I also want to acknowledge the more general damage that's done to the community when a crime like this occurs. You know, this is why people lock their doors at night. This is why people are scared to to walk outside at night. This is why people move away from yeah. our neighborhoods. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I want to acknowledge that this crime, in addition to the awful pain that those, that, that Ms. Spiller went through, that her family consequently went through, um, this also worked a very real harm of that community. Not to mention that shit ass speech he just gave, Your Honor. That should have added an extra 10. And frankly, another blow at a community that doesn't need any more blows. And I want to acknowledge that uh, as well. I also want to say that I um, received the statements sent by family members and friends of the defendant's family. 
uh, I want to acknowledge what must be going through all of your heads. Um, whether you are somebody who settles on this can't be true and this is a horrible injustice that was worked by the birth in this case, or whether, um, and, I, and I want to acknowledge this as well, you know, whatever happened to that 12-year-old, I'm thinking of one of the notes and reflected many of that 12-year-old that was just running up and down the street, you know, that was learning to ride a bike uh, and the like uh, as well. Dang. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that pain and, and that trauma uh, that's worked by this case uh, as well. And last, I also want to to be frank with you, pick up a little bit on what Mr. Whitlock was saying. I'm going to say it maybe in a more academic way, but the United States Supreme Court and our Supreme Court have certainly told me as a district court judge that I've got to acknowledge uh, and balance in making a sentencing decision um, between... Oh, man, he said the Supreme Court, all this, says that he has to make a balanced sentencing. And when a judge starts off something like that during a case like this, chances are he's going to get a light sentence. The judge has to speak on why he does things that he does. And sometimes you can tell these judges want to go well above and beyond the sentencing guidelines that might be put in place from uh, the courts or, you know, the Supreme Courts. I don't know who put the whole balancing system into place, but they're there in a lot of states and they have to go by it. But like I say, you can tell that judges, man, they just wish they could do what they want to do up there sometimes. And if I were to guess, this is one of those situations. Between this remarkably brutal and cruel crime, uh, balance the fact that I am today sentencing something that occurred when the defendant was a child. 14. And all of the things that come along with that, including, as our Supreme Court points out, the fundamental opportunity for redemption for the acts committed at such an age. And all of the things that come along with that, including, as our Supreme Court points out, the fundamental opportunity for redemption. As our Supreme Court points out, the fundamental opportunity of redemption. For the acts committed at such an age. Um, um, it's the Miller Doctrine and cases that fall after that. Um, and it requires me to consider um, the fact that at 14, um, a young man's mind is not fully molded and that uh, we ought to leave room open for uh, the chance for redemption, the chance for rehabilitation for that. What do you all think? So let me walk through that as I make my decision about what sentence is appropriate in this case. Starting. What do you all think about that right there? What do you think about that old Miller doctrine? Me personally? I was 14 at one point. I knew better than to go over there, strangle an old lady and stab her five times. I knew better, so why the fuck can't he know better? I don't like it, and I don't like what the hell this is. It's like the lighting is, I just, you know, edged up a little bit. And I think I got a little razor burn, man. Maybe Brittany smacked me while I was sleeping last night. But I don't agree with this little doctrine or rule, regulation they have in place, because some people deserve the worst of the worst sentencing there is. You know, that that's just my opinion. 14 years old or not. Best job I can in balancing those two things. Just sentence them. So as a consequence, I'm going to ask Mr. Wynn that you and your counsel rise. There we go. Rise to the upper room. Mr. Wynn, a jury uh, has convicted you of a count of intentional murder, a violation of 609.19. I accept that verdict. I adjudicate you guilty of that crime. I sentence you to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 324 months. Against that sentence of 324 months, you are entitled to credit for 1,044 days. I fine you in the amount of $50, but I waive that fine in light of the fully executed nature of the sentence. There is a $78 surcharge that will be taken from prison earnings. I am ordering you to pay restitution uh, to the benefit of the Minnesota Crime Victims Reparation Board in the amount of $3,413, and I will be signing a, an affidavit to that, or affidavit and order, excuse me, uh, to that effect today. I will note that you, that order will be executed subject to the um, uh, 
administrative rules of the Commissioner of Correction to be taken uh, on how much can be taken from prison earnings. I order that you provide a DNA sample if you not, have not already done so. I order that you uh, not uh, ever possess uh, firearms, ammunition, or explosives. If you are caught with any of those things, you'd be subject to a mandatory 60-month uh, commit prison. 324 months is a total of 27 years for the strangulation and stabbing death of an elderly woman while she's sleeping in her own bed. Me, personally, I don't agree. Like I said, man, you probably should have gotten a chamber or something. But that's just me. Shit's crazy, man. But if y'all enjoy, ladies and gentlemen, and learned a little something about the courtroom, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, notification bell before you leave. We drop lockup-related content every single day. Almost no days off.